We have the star of the day. <laughs> From here on out, we might call Sunday Alley Day. <laughs> From here on out, it's Alley Day. <laughs> Alley's having a big day. All right, so here's the deal, Alley. If you do this well, we'll put on a show tonight. <laughs> Alley Talavera. <laughs> Hi guys, as you just said, my name is Ali, and I'm the only graduate playwright for this cohort. Um, so when I was choosing something that I wanted to do for my lecture, I wanted to choose something that was going to be universal for everybody in the room, which is why I picked final monologues, um, specifically why we write them, what makes them so good. Um, if you don't know what a monologue is, that's okay, we're going to learn right now. <laughs> a monologue is a speech given by a single character. It is about 20 to 30 lines in length, which is 60 to 90 seconds, but of course they can go on for more than that. That's just kind of the minimum we want to hit. It's part of a longer conversation specifically for this research, so I'm going to be looking at something that at least has something before it, but not necessarily after it. Monos means alone. Logos means speech, a speech given alone. Um, but they're not to be confused with soliloquies. A monologue is going to be to someone, whereas a soliloquy is given to an audience with that fourth wall in mind. Um, where do we see monologues? We see them in television. We see them in film. I would argue that we see them in video games, right? We see them in speech debates. We see them in sermons, which I will kind of get into more. Um, so my thesis argument is, when well-written and carefully placed, monologues function as beats of narrative catharsis by employing tactics to express the speaker's want. And that's a lot of words and you're staring at it and it's not really sticking, but that's okay because I'm going to explain it a little bit more. Uh, but the real question is kind of, when are final monologues necessary, right? So what are final monologues for, better phrase? Because a character can speak uninterrupted in their monologue, their monologue's going to convey these inner thoughts and emotions that shifts the audience's perspective and begins, one can hope, to start to excitingly move that story. In this research, I'm arguing that a final monologue comes when a character is under immense pressure, pushed to their limits, and has exhausted all other options to achieve their desires. So think of it as this, right? As the story progresses, the air is going to inflate. That's the conflict. And the conflict is going to be preventing them from getting what they want. When it's about to pop, they break. That's the monologue, and it pops in the ending, end of the play, that's it. Or it's going to deflate, and it's going to go through the resolution that's going to end the play. Mm. These monologues are explosive and occur at that perfect moment, causing a shift in the story. They should be effective mechanisms that drive the scene forward and devise a sense of urgency in the narrative. So let's kind of talk about when they're successful. Consider the play Night Mother by Marcia Norman, which puts pressure on our characters from start to end. Our two characters, Mama and Jessie, aren't our typical mother-daughter dynamic. Rather than the mom caring for the daughter, Jessie takes care of Mama. Norman creates this very specific routine for our main characters, except tonight is not going as planned. Mama notices Jessie moving her way through a to-do list instead of paying attention to her. Rather than sharing what's on her list, Jessie attempts to distract Mama with mundane conversation, causing that burst of attention between the two. Norman escalates the conflict by adding the father's pistol to the list of items Jesse tries to find. Finally, Jesse admits, I'm going to kill myself, Mama, to which Mama responds, very funny, very funny. Except it's not funny because Jesse plans to say night mother, go into her room, lock the door, and kill herself. And at this point in the play, Mama has no reason to monologue, right? She doesn't even take Jesse's comment seriously. And if we imagine the conflict inflating like a balloon, this is just the first cup of air. The more mama pushes, the more the air is increasing, and we want that monologue to happen right before or as that balloon pops. And of course mama wants to know why. Instead of directly answering mama, Jessie moves through her list meant to prepare mama for after she passes. Mama employs many tactics to find out why Jessie wants to kill herself, from nagging to begging, then promising she could do whatever it takes to fix it, but nothing seems to work. They both agree that mama's words will not sway Jessie's choices. And at this point, the conflict causes the balloon to inflate so much, it's on the verge of bursting. Then, for the first time in the play, we hear Jesse say, Night Mother, go into the bedroom and lock the door. Mama delivers the final monologue that ends the play. And as writers, we want to push our characters to this moment where everything has been taken or they're confronted by the worst possible thing <coughs> happening in order to justify a monologue. And when I say justify, I mean that there is no other option. After she says night mother, mama has lost all her power. It shows as she begins to switch tactics with every line. 
let me in there, I'm not gonna stop screaming, what if I don't do the things you want me to do, I didn't know. Resentment turns into anger as mama will say anything to save her daughter. But the story takes a tragic turn as indicated by the stage directions. And mama stops for a moment, breathless and frantic, putting her ear to the door, and we hear the shot, and it sounds like an answer, it sounds like no. And mama collapses against the door, tears streaming down her face, but not screaming anymore, in shock now. The final monologue spans only about 15 lines and it is dominated by stage direction rather than actual dialogue. Norman intentionally crafts this monologue with more stage directions to emphasize how mama spends all her time talking and not enough time listening. The use of the stage direction in this place, the use, and use of stage direction in place of Jesse forces mama to stop talking and finally listen. The audience, Mama and Jesse, feel the same release of the balloon popping in, and we hear the gunshot. The worst possible thing that could happen has happened. We don't have anything left to wait for. And the first time we hear about Jesse's plan, a monologue would have been out of place. However, in this exact moment, there resides no other option but to explode. Mama does not achieve her goal, but the monologue achieves its desired effect on the audience and gives Mama a cathartic moment and a huge hit of self-awareness when she says, I thought you were mine. And you're like, Ali, I've never read this play, and I think you just spoiled the ending for me. I get that, but I know a lot of people have seen this film, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Very similar to what's going on in Night Mother, the daughter in this film wants to convince her mother, life means nothing, nothing matters, my life sucks, I need you to let me go, let me go into this void. And after this monologue, for the first time in the movie, we see the mother stop and listen and say, okay, which creates this narrative catharsis and this emotional victory, and that's what makes this movie so impactful and so meaningful, is it's, it's awakening in both of our characters. And not only does this film use the three-act structure from playwriting, but it associates each act with a rising line of action for each of our main characters. Rising action is a series of incidents that's escalating that urgency, leading to that climatic event at the end, but it's forcing our audience to come back and see what happens next. So we build and we build and we build into that final moment where she lets go. And now, yes, I'm showing you a video, and in these clips, she's letting go of every timeline. But when she gives the monologue, it's just her standing and delivering. So the balloon doesn't pop, it deflates. And because of that moment, we get up and over the falling action, which leads us to Evelyn's monologue right here, where she says, wait, but we can't have one without the other. And it's the same way we only have live elements in theater, this film chooses to have these monologues intimately, face to face, without any effects, despite all of the amazing cinematography we see in this film. So, everything's gonna come back to playwriting. Um, <laughs> to break it down a little more, I drew these, so I apologize. Um, but I kind of want to answer the question Does the monologue have to be on the very last page to be considered final? So, in this illustration, <laughs> the typical, typical breakdown pyramid, but the monologue is either going to encapsulate the falling action and the resolution in the monologue on the very last page, the very last beat, because that's going to be the pop, right? But it can also happen at that climax moment, right? Because the final monologue is the pivotal moment that unites the dramatic movement and brings us to that resolution. It's gonna be the event that stops the action and pushes us through the falling action wherein the cycle of events is concluded in either catastrophe or solution. And as writers, we get to decide when that is, right? Yes and no. What really drove me to this research is when I was writing my thesis play. My character stopped talking, and I remember being really stuck. And I shared those pages with Mickey, and he read them and he said, this is where she monologues. And I had been reading the same scene over and over and over again. But it wasn't until I went back to the very beginning and I got up to that scene that I said, oh, this is where she monologues. Um, it's the event that stops the action and pushes us through the rest. So hopefully that kind of is sitting a little bit easier with it. Um, so think about that also while I start to talk about the next play. John Patrick Shanley's play Doubt is set in the 1960s, and it centers around an allegation made by Sister Alanis against Father Flynn, caught alone in the boy in the rectory. Very simple terms, a grown man alone with a young boy in the dark. Sister Alan shares her version of events about Father Flynn's behavior to Sister James. Context clues, Sister Alan is cold, mean teacher, no one likes her. Whereas Sister James is the high five, give me a hug, everybody's favorite teacher, right? So of course he shouldn't be alone with a boy in church. And Sister James is a little bit more empathetic, you know, did something happen, maybe he was helping. Sister Alan is like, nope, he's a pedophile, I'm gonna make sure everybody knows it. So meanwhile, Father Flynn is trying to clear his name and establish innocence. 
Shanley cleverly weaves Father Flynn's sermons into his monologues, which align with the events in the story. Specifically, in this sermon, Father Flynn tries to prove his innocence. When Father Flynn delivers this sermon, the rumor of him and said boy has already made its way around. Way around. Without confronting Sister Alice directly, this sermon is then allowed to speak freely. The monologue starts with the line, a woman was gossiping with a friend about a man she hardly knew. He's referring to the very act of conflict in the play. Then, I know none of you have ever done this. Considering the audience are people of the church, Father Flynn begins to manipulate them to regain control of this narrative. He narrates a fictional story to motivate them into not further spreading the rumors. The balloon begins to fill with every single scene that revolves around Sister Alice accusing Father Flynn of wrongdoing. Rather than his monologue popping the balloon, it acts as that final push of air. In this sermon, he can openly tell a story as a way to manipulate what he wants. When Father Flynn says, sorry, let me give you some context. In the beginning of the monologue, this woman was gossiping with a friend about a man she hardly knew, and she feels the almighty hand of God above her and a finger pointing down at her. So she comes to the father and she says, is gossiping a sin? And he says, yes, you ignorant, badly brought up female, you have borne false witness against your neighbor, you have played fast and loose with his reputation, and you should be heartily ashamed. In church, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he approaches this a lot better than to say, stop talking about it, right? The biblical reference means the church in believing harmless chatter with a friend is resulting in direct punishment from God. Father Flynn does not seem to care at this point. He knows the gospel will tarnish his reputation. He vents his anger publicly during the sermon and violently blames this woman, using the finger of God as a symbolic weapon. And not only is the sermon a way to argue his innocence, but it also serves as a moral guide and defense. The conflict between these two motives is what's making this monologue so compelling. Despite his drive to prove his innocence, the monologue also sets the stage for the play's final moments. Even though Father Flynn monologue occurs a few scenes before the play ends, it appears at his climax. Monologues, as the balloon is about to burst, provide moments of resolution and catharsis for characters, under pressure in their narrative arc. Shanley places the sermon at Father Flynn's pivotal moment of desperation to achieve that narrative catharsis. I know. I know. <laughs> Another association of play writing lecture. But let's talk about it. Ratatouille, Anton Ego, a man who hates food but loves to destroy reputations. Shortly before the finale, Ego attends a dinner at Gusteau's where he eats the famous dish Remy makes him. So I'm showing you this scene so that we can see the awakening. We witness him drop his pen, right, which is technically his weapon, the thing that he uses to write these reviews, and we physically see the transformation of his character. We see him smile, and then we see him eat. But after this, Ego delivers a review in the form of a voiceover. In plays, we have a lot more expository dialogue than in screenwriting, because you can't use visual signals in movies, um, like they do in movies. But we so often see the action of the play itself dealing with the buildup or the aftermath of an event, whereas in screenwriting, obviously, the violence, the cinematic moments, the stuff I'm showing you, is the good stuff. It's the stuff the audience wants to see. And the reason I talk about movies in a playwriting lecture is to highlight why monologues and movies are so remembered and how they borrow the techniques we use in playwriting. Exposition is dealt with pretty easily in film. You show characters going through actions, and these in turn establish characters and relationships along with driving the plot on. Um, I think where this all comes together, though, is the expression of emotion. When screenwriting steals this technique from playwriting and explicitly tells us through a monologue a character's transformation or internal awakening the same way we see in everything everywhere all at once, we feel that cathartic release. And we feel it because it's not about the silent montage moments anymore. You can't hide behind action shots. It's when a character stands and delivers. And with any artistic work, the expression of emotion is the apex of the work. It is the peak, it's the pinnacle, it's the crescendo of everything that came before it. And that's my biggest point. Everything that comes before it leads us to that very moment where we have to sometimes explicitly express emotion in order to create that catharsis. So we answered this question, right? It doesn't have to be on the final page, um, but I want us to think about that as we move into the next one. Um, and also think about how do you know when it's the right time to monologue, right? And is it the actual craft of the monologue? Is it coming at the right time? I'd argue that it's both. And 
We're going to talk about a play that can completely tear apart my argument. <laughs> Setting Scenes of Halloween by Jeffrey M. Jones focuses on a husband and wife's experience during the single night of October 31st, Halloween. Physically, Jeff and Joan encounter ghosts, witches, and monsters, metaphorically haunting them about memories in their past. In scrambled order, the scenes jump from frightening, frighteningly scary wolves and phantoms back into an unraveling marriage pool. As monsters appear and scare, interjecting with mundane conversation the couple has, the audience pieces together the underlying dramatic question, who are the real monsters? So, like I just said, this play can be told, and I didn't say that already, but I'm sorry. This play can be told in any order. Um, it prides itself on it. It's literally 70 scenes. It's flexible. The playwright says it's up to you, the, the director, to put it in whatever way you want. So why would I choose a play that can have a monologue anywhere? To really analyze how placement affects the character's climax and argue how it affects that feeling of narrative catharsis. So, in the way that it's published, we have the 21st scene, and Jeff and Joan are fighting like an old married couple over who's gonna answer the door. It's not like, oh my god, you get it. It's like, oh my god, get the door. And you're like, where is this tension coming from, right? And then you flip the page, and you get, all right, I fucked her. Is that what you wanted to hear? <laughs> is it? You wanna know, god damn it, you're gonna know three times I fucked her. <sighs> Audibly, physically, you feel that deflation because we got into that buildup. And my whole argument with this monologue is that it's gonna depend obviously on the playwright's vision, the themes as well as the intentions of that creative director, but if this monologue comes too soon, right? You guys all just sit down, we just got to the playhouse and he opens it, all right, I fucked her! Okay. Who's next to you, who are we talking about? It's good, it's juicy, and you want more, but you're not there yet, and we don't wanna give it to them too soon because we want to get that build up. So I don't see this being in the beginning. Maybe it could be in the middle, like we talked about, kind of on that deflation, or towards the end. But placement does matter, right? But do final monologues always have to explode with emotion to create a moment of narrative catharsis, right? What qualifies as that release, as that pop or that deflation? Does it have to be as theatrical as a literal death and night mother? Does it have to be verbally powerful, like in doubt? Does our character have to admit everything the way Jeff does in 70 Scenes of Halloween? Moving back into final monologues found on the very last page of the play, Mary Jane by playwright Amy Herzog constructs a world where a mother and her son struggle with their physical health. Her son, Alex, born at 26 weeks, as a reference point, you're not wearing the turn to close. Uh, he suffers from every illness one can imagine. He eats through G tube, has occurring seizures, lacks cognitive receptors, a constant influx of temperature drops, and paralyzed vocal cords. <coughs> However, Mary Jane suffers just as much trying to keep her little boy alive. During the play, we observe numerous instances where Mary Jane experiences mental, emotional, and physical turmoil. From an outsider's view, Alex's reliance appears to be a significant daily burden. As the play progresses, we become aware of Mary Jane's ongoing battle with migraines, and despite not admitting it, the stress from her son is only exuberating those symptoms. Herzog illustrates the depths of a mother's love for her child through this story. To achieve this, she masterfully crafts unique character dynamics by highlighting Alex's physical limitations and Mary Jane's sense of moral obligation to care for her son. At the end of the play, Mary Jane sits in a hospital room wearing a hospital sanitation <coughs> suit that makes her look like this giant white bunny. And a Buddhist nun, Tenki, joins her, offering her just religious vibes while her son Alex undergoes surgery. Mary Jane's feeling a migraine come on, so Tenki attempts to, attempts to distract her by asking about Alex, her son. Amy Herzog, her playwright, carefully places this final monologue at the exact moment we need it in Mary Jane's arc. She starts by saying, I'm five times his size, and he seems to have hardly any muscle control, but I'm telling you, if he doesn't want to sit, I cannot get him to sit in that damn chair. When recounting her experiences, the audience can perceive the genuine nature of her affection, despite being very aware that his medical, condition, medical conditions hinder the indication of a distinct personality, she sees him for who he truly is. She kind of keeps going. She says, he loves fish, of course. He loves our superintendent's dog. He likes the feeling of extreme sensory. He likes touching snow and ice. He likes seeing his breath in the winter. Um, if, you know, if he doesn't want me to put him in his chair, you know, he can't move. And sometimes I like, put him in the chair and I run up and down the street and I go as fast as I can. And people are looking at me like I'm crazy. Like, is that safe? Is he supposed to be doing that? But he just grins and grins. And then she lets us know he's almost three. And we get that age for the first time, right? And 
as she's saying this, it's sad and it's sincere because we know that he can't move, he can't smile, he can't laugh. But rather than absorbing the stress negatively, she just sees Alex as hers. Alex's inability to move or speak creates this unimaginable dependency on Mary Jane to survive. As she gives this monologue, for the first time in the play, Mary Jane sits calmly in a room while someone finally takes care of her instead of her taking care of Alex. Because despite thinking as a reader, we're so worried about Alex, we're so worried about this baby, we're way more worried about her. And nothing physically dramatic is happening on this last page, nor does Mary Jane explode with emotion. She ends the monologue by saying, I don't know whether he's going to make it out of the surgery. I don't know what to hope for anymore. The Buddhist nun responds, I can see him very clearly. Thank you. Finally, Mary Jane achieves her want, for someone to see Alex for who he is and not the medical conditions that hold him back. She doesn't cry. Instead, we see Mary Jane smiles a bit. The audience feels that moment of cathartic release within that small stage direction, because in the same way we've been overseeing Alex, the audience has been caring for her. And as we reach these final beats, the concern over his well-being has faded, right? And we recognize that no matter what, Mary Jane will be okay. Talk about screenwriting, talk about playwriting, gotta talk about fiction. Uh, so we all know, hopefully, and love this book, The Faulkner Stars by John Green. And it's gonna be spoiled, I'm so sorry if you haven't read it, but two kids that have cancer, you know they're gonna die, you decide to read the book anyways, but <laughs> our, main characters, <laughs> our main character is Hazel Grace, in the same kind of way that we see Mary Jane and Alex, Hazel Grace obviously meets other cancer boy, and they're both gonna die, but instead of worrying more about her physical health, she's worried way more about Augustus. And throughout the story, our narrator worries more about her, obviously, or, or about him than her own health, but he's more afraid that people are going to forget him when he dies. His whole fear of this makes him want to do something super memorable during his life that will keep him from being forgotten after his death, right? He wants to be remembered. She just wants to keep him alive. And obviously he dies in the book, I'm so sorry. Uh, but she's attending his funeral, follow blah, blah, blah. He ends up writing her a eulogy and getting it to her. It's so depressing, okay. But the eulogy that he writes her is on the very last page of the book. And he's saying, you know, almost everyone is obsessed with leaving a mark upon this world, bequeathing a legacy, outlasting death. We all want to be remembered. The marks humans leave are too often scars. I got my wish, I suppose. I left my scar. And by the time you're, you're just like sobbing, like you're just sitting like reading a book, like why did I do this? Uh, but both of these final monologues lack physical danger or lack physical action and present danger, right? The Fall in Our Stars has a character that's literally sitting reading a letter, very similar to the way Mary Jane is sitting and just talking to a nun. Augustus is finally, in The Fall in Our Stars, is finally released from the spirit, right? Knowing that Hazel Grace, our narrator, is always going to remember him. But Hazel is also released because she no longer needs to worry about the worst possible thing happening because it's happened. So, if a writer knows where they're going to put a monologue, it will not be a good monologue. Writers should not force them onto paper or they will feel forced through the character. The best, most memorable monologues are well-written and carefully placed and occur right before or as that balloon pops. They function like deflating balloons, releasing everything, admitting everything they need to achieve their want. Why we write them and what makes them good goes hand in hand. Even when the monologue's intention neglects communication or acts as advice to avoid transformation, it's memorable because the audience and the characters have built up to that final pop. And maybe that was the exact intention of the playwright to end with a lack of catharsis in a character, but can still leave them with the opportunity to express their deepest desires and wants, thereby achieving a sense of emotional resolution. The monologue has the power to evoke strong emotions within us, whether it be the most painful part or the most inspiring. Um, the emotional release resonates by keeping us laughing or crying, fully engaged, coming back to see it, read it, and feel it all over again. Obviously, it's not the only thing, but 
as a pattern, like of that happening in final long well, rounds? That shut door in Night Mother is a shut door. Like there's no audience for it any longer, in a way. Well, the, yes. Before the shot. Right? I don't necessarily see it as a pattern. I think that it, it goes into the intention of like the, what it's trying to gather is that in that final moment when the door is shut and like she loses everything like that was the intention to get her to stop and to finally listen and that's kind of they both achieve a weird one because jesse wants to take her life mama wants to save her and even though jesse gets her want of death she also gets her want of her mom to kind of like step up and be a mom and be the one that's going to take care of her so i don't necessarily see it as a pattern um because i think when it does happen it's a very intentional cool thanks So I noticed that you didn't choose any plays that are monologue plays. Yes. Um, and I would love to hear about why, and if you did kind of look at any of those plays that are just strictly either one person or like Faith Healer, three different monologues. I honestly never picked them up because I wanted to really look at like what, what makes us like so attached to these characters. And I remember in my best gave them a lecture and talked about like narratives and like narratives are what we're drawn to. But like when you do get a monologue in a narrative, it's typically that one character, you're watching that one character build up to that moment um, to a final monologue. Whereas in a monologue play, it's kind of a repetition of individual stories rather than an overall arc of the story. So I did not look at them, um, but I also didn't, I don't know, I guess it didn't like fit into like exactly what I was trying to accomplish. Todd. Uh, great job, Allie. Um, you talked a bit about having several characters have monologues. I'm thinking about doubt in this case. So for instance, like when the, when the mother has that great monologue about, you know, maybe we're talking about the boy's nature now, you know? You know what I'm talking about that scene? So does it, is, it, is the monologue different if it's given from the point of view of the antagonist, the priest, or if it's from the protagonist or from a, a third person? Does the value of it change in some way? Does the value of it change in some way? Yeah, like with, if, if, so like with, if the mother in doubt, she's not the main character, mm -hmm. but she's certainly having a function in the drama, right? Yes, um, and I think that when you do finally get to that monologue, it starts to kind of crack. Like it kind of really like, it is doubt. Everything is about the doubt because we don't have any actual evidence of this thing happening. Um, and I think that the intention of it kind of varies because it's not from our main character and it is actually kind of supporting the other character's argument. Um, but I think it's intended for Sister Alanis and kind of affects the way that her arc is going rather than our main character for Father Flynn. So, oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I think you I think you're done. Ladies and gentlemen.